Hey Blender Bob here, about a month ago I published a teaser for Shockwave Effect and I said if I get a thousand likes I will show you how to do it. And I did get my thousand likes, so now there it is. And I cannot believe I got 10 thumb down for an 8 second clip. I guess you cannot please everyone. Anyways, so the clip was inspired by a job we just finished for ESPN. Now I'm not allowed to show you the clip because I don't have the rights for it, but the link is right up there somewhere and also in the description so you can go take a look at it and then come back and I will show you how I did it. So it turns out that I already had a track plate of New York for another job I did a long, long time ago. So I had a low res model, I had the camera track, I had everything. So I thought, well, might as well use this. So let's start right now. So the first thing we want to do is to create a master object. This is where we're going to do our geo node stuff and could be any object. It doesn't matter. It's not important. We're not going to render that object anyway. So I'm going to call it master, just like what my staff called me. From this master, we're going to create a geometry node script or whatever it's called. And I'm going to turn it off on the visibility because I don't want to see it. I'm going to pin it to make sure that it always stays there as I do some changes. Okay, now we need some objects in there to do our simulation. We're going to start with something simple like a sphere and a grid. One thing very, very important when you do geometry node, you want to make sure that if you move or scale some objects before you start doing any geometry node stuff, you need to apply the transformations. Let me just get rid of the grid here. I don't want to see it. All right. Okay. So I was saying you need to apply the transformation. So for that, you're going to go into object and you're going to go into apply and you go all transforms. All right. Now let's bring these two objects into our geometry node grid. So I'm just going to drag them in there. Now, if we do it this way, we're going to be stuck with that sphere and that grid forever. We want to be able to change it. We want to do a master file so we can change any time for any objects that we want. So you just need to connect this to the group input there. And now you will see the object. So you can go there and select any object that you want. So for example, if I add a monkey here, I can now go directly into the modifier and change whatever objects I want. Well, actually, if I want to see the objects, I need to create a join geometry and I need to connect these objects. No, I don't want that. I want to connect these objects that I just plugged into the node and I don't see anything because I'm an idiot and I turned off the visibility on the master. So let me turn it back on. Here we go. No, so now we get our monkey and I can change to whatever I want a sphere or back to a monkey, but let's go back to the sphere. The next step is to cover all these geometry with points. So we're going to create a few nodes. We're going to create a distribute point on faces. And you can just slide it until it connects. All right. And you can duplicate it, uh, control D and connect it to the other one. All right. But now we only see the points. We don't see the geometry anymore. So what we're going to do is to reconnect them. So I will go straight from the geometry output here and connect it into my joint geometry. So for this one and for the grid. But now it's becoming a little bit messy because I got four connections to the joint geometry. And if I go and close up, I don't know which one is which. So a little trick that I do is just to create other joint geometry nodes and I just rename them. They are completely useless. I just use them to identify the noodles. Okay, just give me a second to reconnect everything. Okay, clean up time. We know that our force field is going to move through the city, so we will need a transform node in order to move it. You cannot do this in the animation of the object itself. You have to do this in the geometry node. So I will just create my transform node here and put it right after this geometry. Now at this point, what we want is to generate points on the geometry according to the distance from each other. In order to do this, I will need to create two recast nodes. So these are the nodes that will calculate the distance between one object to the other. Now take a good look here. The top geometry is connected to the lower recast and the lower geometry is connected to the top recast node because we don't want to recast on itself. We want to do it on the other object. We need to tell the recast node what it's going to use to calculate the distance and that's going to be done from the normals. So we're going to create a normal node and we're going to connect it in the ray direction. Same thing for the bottom node. This is what we're doing here. So we take the sphere and we say, okay, cast some rays until you hit something. So it's just going to go according to the normals and just shoot some beams like this until it hits something. And sometimes it's, it won't it's just going to go to the infinity. Same thing for the plane. It's going to shoot uh, beams up. In this case, it's up because the normals are flat. So all the beams are going to be in the same direction until it hits some object. And just like the sphere, some of the beams are going to be lost into infinity. <laughs> if you thought I would do motion graphics, forget it. Photoshop screen grab. 
I'm that lazy. So the calculation has been done. Now we need to tell it that the hit distance, which is the beam that we just calculated, will go into the density. So the density will be done according to the hits. And we do the same thing for the sphere. Now, if you take a good look, you will see that we actually get the opposite of what I want. Let me just turn off the geometry. It's gonna be super easy, barely an inconvenience. I just need to mute the noodles. With the Node Wrangler add-on, just use Control Alternate and right click to turn it on and off. Okay, now we get a better view of what's going on. And you can see that if I move the plane here with the transform node that I created, you can see the effect happening in real time, but you can also see that it's the opposite of what we want. So to fix that, we're gonna create a map range node, actually two of them, one for each. So I'll set the first parameter to 10. And then if I play with the last one to max, you can see this is what I want and I can play with the density here of the points. And same thing at the bottom, if I play with the settings, now you see we can get what we want. There are a few of these settings that we will want to tweak all the time and going into the node editor to tweak them all, it's a bit complicated. So what we wanna do is to be able to do this directly in the modifier and this is how we're gonna do this. Let's start with the transform node. If I drag it into the group input, you can see it appears here straight into the modifier. We may also want to use the map range setting so we can change the density of the point. So I will just take it and drag it in the input node like this. And if we don't want the entire thing to become a complete mess, we need to make sure that we'll rename everything. So to max doesn't mean anything. I'm just going to rename it to density A. And same thing at the bottom, we're going to call it density B. Okay, time for a little cleanup. I will select all these nodes and press Shift P to put them into a box like this. And I will rename it Point Generator. Yeah, it's kind of hard to read with the colors by default, but if you zoom in, you can see that it's actually called, yeah, Point Generator. Now, the next part, I totally ripped it off from someone else's tutorial. It was pretty cool. It was about a monkey and a half a sphere that would generate this lightning on it. And I would love to give the guy the credits, but I, I cannot find this clip anymore on YouTube. So if you know what it is, please tell me. I will put it in the comments because it was really, really useful. Now we need to connect these points from top and bottom objects. So we're gonna create a curve line and we cannot just drag it there. It's not gonna work because it doesn't know what to connect to what. So we're gonna create an instance to point node. Now this node doesn't have a purpose in life because it doesn't know what it's supposed to instance. So we're gonna connect the curve into instance and now you see all these points have been converted. Well, not converted, but instance into curves. Uh, maybe we have too many curves. Is there a way we can set that? Of course we can. We're going to create a random value. And what we're going to do is to collect the value into the selection. And we're going to want to make sure here that this is a Boolean. So that will create here a probability. And whoops, it disconnected. So let me connect it again. That probably happened when I changed the pop-up for Boolean. Anyway, I'm going to reconnect it to the selection. And now you get the probability here. And if I play with it, you see what happens. This is another value I want to be able to control from the modifier. So I'm going to take the probability and just drag it all the way there. And now I see it here. I can just play right there. Now the problem we have is that the curves are just generated from one set of points from the plane. We want them to go from the plane to the sphere. So we need to find a way to tell the curve to take the, the points from the sphere, to take the attributes there from the sphere for the end of the curve. So we're gonna do a transfer attribute and that means get this attribute from the points here. We connected it to the sphere, all the points from the sphere into the target. And we wanna make sure that we will change the pop-up here to vector because the points are coordinates X, Y, Z. A float is just one number, a vector is, is X, Y, and Z. Now, which attribute do we want to get from these points? We want to get, of course, the position. So the position would be connected into the attributes. So that means that we took these points here, the position, and we copied this attribute into the transfer attribute node. For a reason that I cannot explain, you need to realize the curves, probably because there are instances and they're all, all exactly the same. So when you realize them, there won't be instances anymore. So each curve will be uh, adapted separately. That's probably what it is. I don't know, but you need to do it. And now we're gonna set a position. Now, what are we gonna set for this position? We want to set the endpoint of the curve. We know the position of the points. We just extracted it with the transfer attribute. So we're gonna connect it into the position. But the position of what? What exactly the, we need to tell it is to the end of the curve. So in order to do this, we're gonna plug something into the selection. And what we're gonna plug is the 
endpoint selection. So you get this node here, and we're going to say, no, this one is zero. It's not the start one, one, the end point, and that's going to be our selection. And now the points are connected from the plane to the sphere, but they all go to the center. Why is that? That's because in the transfer attribute, we made a little mistake. We need to change this to nearest, and now it works. Okay, I don't see my points anymore on the plane, so let me just create another joint geometry, and I will connect it to the original distribute point on faces. Clean up time, let me select all these nodes and group them together, and well, not group them, but frame them together and call it Curve Generator. So now what we have is straight lines, but what we want is lightning, so we need to make it look like, well, lightning. This is how we're going to do it. The first step is to add a resample curve, so this way we can decide the amount of divisions that we want on our curve. So just play with the slider, how many do you want, and that's it. All right, but it's still a straight line. Now we need to move these points around, so we're going to do a set position. So what happens if we just plug a noise into the offset? Let's see what it does. I'm going to create a noise texture and just going to plug it straight into the offset. And woof, I got this. You can see everything moves and it moves in only one direction. It's not, it's not what we want. So it looks like it's just doing something in 2D. Okay, so let's get rid of the noise texture. We're going to do something else instead. We're going to use a random value. So random value. Now, we want a vector here because we're moving in X, Y, and Z. So just like before, we don't want to float. We want to be able to move in every direction. Now, if I put this, you can see now I get something in all three dimensions, but it offsets also on the side. So we can compensate by doing minus one, minus one, minus one. So this way, it's going in both directions. It's stretching in every direction. It's obviously too strong. So what we're going to do is to create, well, let's try a math node because, you know, random value is blue. So let's put a math node because it's blue also. But no, it does it only in one direction because, again, it's a vector. So we don't want to do a math node. We want to do a vector math node instead. So bye-bye math node. We're going to create a vector math node instead. Connect the in and the out. And we're going to change it to multiply. We have three values here that we can play with, but you know, I like to change them all at the same time. So I'm just going to create a value node and I'm going to plug it into the vector here. So this way I can only change one. And it's going to change all three of them at the same time. And here we go. Another thing you can do if your graph becomes too heavy is to group nodes together. So this is what I'm going to do here. I'm going to select all of them and I'm going to group them together. Now I'm inside the group and I can connect stuff that I want to be able to use later. So for example, the count, I can just plug it here and I get the count and the vector here. Instead of using the value, I'm just connected straight into the group. I can get rid of this one. I don't need it anymore. Okay, so vector doesn't mean much. So maybe I should just rename it. So I will go in here and change the vector to, let's call it uh, value instead. Okay, now if I go back here, you can see I got my count and I got my value, but I still got my three numbers here. So if I go back inside the group, instead of a vector, I can say I want to float instead. So now if I go back to my nodes here, you can see it's a value here that I can change like this and change the count. All right, that's pretty cool. Now we're going to copy this group to do like a secondary pass of noise. But first, I'm going to rename it. It's very important to always name yourself. Otherwise, later you come back and you don't remember what it is. What is node group? That means nothing. So now it's called noise. All right, I'm going to do a duplicate of this noise here. So I will get my secondary noise. So you can play with it and you realize, well, it doesn't do what I expected it to do. It looks very similar to the first noise. Why is that? Well, here's the thing. Click on the little number two here. So now it's a separate node. It's completely independent from the first one. And now you can get all the details that you want in your sparks. Okay, we're getting there, we're getting there, but these are just lines. They cannot be rendered. So we need to transform them into geometry. To convert the curves into mesh, well, we use a curve to mesh, which, you know, kind of makes sense. Curve to mesh, here you go. And now we need to put a profile curve. So we're gonna create a circle curve and we're gonna plug it into the profile curve. And now all we need to do is to adjust the resolution. We don't need 32, eight is enough. Actually three could do the job. And we change the radius to get what we want. And here we go, cool. Maybe you don't want the sparks to have all the same size, you know, bigger at the beginning and smaller at the end. Well, there's a way you can do this. First, we need to set the curve radius. So set curve radius, boom, right there. 
and we're going to use a map range to decide the beginning and the end of the curve. But once I connect the result to the radius, even if I change the settings from the max and the min, it doesn't change anything. Why is that? It's because, well, the map range is like, yeah, I can change the range, but the range of what? It's the curve parameter. So we're going to create the curve parameter and that's going to tell the map range, well, I want to do this from the beginning to the end of the curve. So now you can mess around with the settings. You can make the beginning bigger, the ending bigger, in the middle smaller, in the middle bigger. You can do whatever you wish you want to do. You know the curve radius? Maybe this is something I want to reuse later in the modifier. So I'm just going to drag it all the way to the beginning right here. And here we go. I got my radius now available in my modifier. Little cleanup again. This is going to be my geo generator. Okay, we need to shade that thing. So I'm going to go into my master node and I'm going to create an emission shader. Just put it blue. Yeah, that should be it. I'm going to rename it. Always name your stuff. Always. If you don't rename your stuff and you give it to me, you're going to do push ups. Hey, it's been a while since I said that. Okay, so back in geo node, I'm going to create a set material node. Just plug it at the end use spark and that's it now i will just mute the connections for all the stuff i don't need to see anymore so using control option and right mouse button i can just drag and bloop, turn them off and we are done with the geometry node stuff now i can move my object around i can play with all the settings i can adjust it and tweak it on a per scene basis <laughs> Okay, so I got my New York model and my force field in the scene. Let me just rename it. Always name your stuff. You're going to do push-ups. Okay, so now I go back to my master and now I can change to whatever I want here. That's why we made it this way. So this is going to be my force field and this is going to be my city. So it takes a while to calculate, but then... <coughs> and then you choke. <laughs> okay, and then... <laughs> Continue. We get an absolute mess here. This is not what we wanted. And that's because our cylinder here, our force field, doesn't have enough subdivision. And also it's very, very flat. So we're going to fix that. I told you we were done with the geometry nodes. Well, I lied. Okay, let me move that stuff around so I can work. Now I need to create a subdivide mesh node. And I will crank up the subdivision to 4. Now I'm going to move these points around by using a set position node. And on this set position node, I'm going to add a noise for the offset. So this way I will be able to play with it and change the intensity of the noise to get the result that is desired. So noise, I plug it straight into the offset. But the problem is when I want to tweak the settings for the noise texture, it takes forever because it tries to refresh all the lightning effects and that takes forever. So I will jump at the end of the script and just disable the node here, the noodle. So it's going to be faster this way. All right, let's go back to the noise. Now, even if I play with the settings, I still don't get what I want. Doesn't matter how much I tweak it. It makes some changes, but not enough. So what I could do is add a multiply node. Again, we're doing vectors, so we want a vector math here. And like all the time, we want to put this to multiply. And we're just going to multiply a value. Well, again, I'm going to create a value node because I want to be able to change all three at the same time. Yeah, I know I could select all three of them, and but it's annoying. I prefer to do it this way. Okay, now we get something much more usable because the normals are all pointing in different directions. And that's going to help a lot when we do the lightning. Let me turn it back on. Okay, now I can see my stuff. Well, let's take a look at the lightning in shaded mode. Well, okay, I see them, but there's the wall here that's in the way, so I'm just going to turn off. Actually, I'm going to mute here this noodle so I don't see it. And now we reach a point where we need to adjust everything. We can adjust the probability and the density A and density B. Okay, I need to animate the wall, so I will turn it back on so I can see what I'm doing. This part is stupid easy. You just need to keyframe the translation, and then you move to another frame, change the translation settings again, and put another keyframe. Make sure everything is in linear. And one more time, I'm going to turn off the wall because I don't want to see it. I just want to see the sparks. I'm going to switch to cycles so I can see what I'm doing. And I want to turn this on, the rendering. And uh, yeah, okay, there's the environment, 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 run, run, run. And I want to turn off the run, 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 run light to black. So now I get to what I want. And maybe the uh, shading is not very good for the sparks. I will just tweak it a little bit, change the color, maybe it's a little bit brighter, more blue. Yeah, okay, that looks pretty cool. 
let's take a closer look and uh, well it's not as good when we look at it like this compared to what we had with the sphere and the plane that's because they were really tiny compared to the city so we will need to change the settings for the uh, the noise that we have on the curves remember those two guys just play with them until you get something snazzy it's actually much faster to do these settings in eevee but you don't get all the glow that comes with it. But if it's just to tweak the, 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 the sparks themselves, well, that's fine. So let's play the animation, see what it looks like. And I got my sparks going all around the city. Well, around, you know, I mean around, like around the buildings, around the city. Literally. Okay, I will go back to the master node and I'm going to create new shaders because I know I will need them for the layer passes. So I will need a white one. This is going to be just an emission white. I will need a black one. So an emission with just no emission, just black. I will also need an ambient occlusion shader. For the occlusion shader, I just create the ambient occlusion and I create a ramp and I can connect it directly into the material. I don't even need the principal BSDF or I don't need an emission. I don't need anything. There's one last shader that I need. It's called a diffuse white. It's just a white diffuse shader. Nothing spectacular about it. Uh, I just forgot to change it to diffuse. I left it to principal BSDF, but it's supposed to be just a diffused white shader. Time for render layers. So I will take my master and I will put it in a new collection called Sparks. I will duplicate my master twice. One will be called front light and the other one will be called backlight. I will select my master and rename the geonode master. Then I will select my front light and here I will press on the little three button here to make sure that I get a copy of the script here and dependent and I will call it front light. Now in front light I don't need all the sparks so I'm going to remove everything that's related to the sparks. The point distribution, the curves, all this stuff, I don't need it. I will clean it up. I only want to keep the geometry. Okay, now that's clean. Back in the outliner, I will select front light and back light and put them in their own collections. Since I'm in the spark render layer, I will turn off front light and back light. Now I'm going to create two more render layers. I'm going to call them front light and back light. In these collections, well, front light will only have the front light collection on, and in the back light, only the back light. Black, 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 black. In the back light render layer, I only have the back light collection. It wasn't that hard yeah here we go all right let's work with the front light so if i go in my geometry node here i can add a set material to the city and it's just going to be my diffuse white for the wall itself i'm going to add another set material and this one is going to be my white my emission white so set material set material and i'm going to select the white 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 uh, this one we have two issues here. The wall is white on both sides and also it's visible and we don't want to see the wall itself. We just want to see the light. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to create a transform node and we're going to add a slight offset to the original one. So transform, just put something very tiny. I'm going to add a join geometry node so I can connect both of them together. And I'm going to add a set shader node for the second one to put it black. And it doesn't work. And that's because I got a set material at the end of the chain. So that's going to override everything. So what I need to do is remove the set material from there and put it just in front of the join geometry. So I'm just going to drag it here and now it works. But my offset is in the wrong direction. So I need to change this to a negative value. So let's try something very tiny. Minus 0.1 will do the job. I need to do the same thing but the opposite for the backlight. So I'm going to click on the two here and rename this one backlight. So now I got a copy of the front light script but it's independent. It's not linked anymore. And I'm just going to switch the shader. This one's going to be black and this one is going to be white. And now I got the opposite. Now it's white, this white. And now it's lighting in the back. Okay, so that works, but I still see the wall on both layers. How can I get rid of them? It's actually quite simple. What I'm going to do is go in the object property and in the visibility, I'm just going to turn off camera. So it's not going to be visible in the camera. And I'm going to take my New York geometry here, the original one, and just move it to the backlight layer. Turn it back on and here we go. I need to do the same thing for the front light. To have an object in more than one collection, you just select it and in the outliner you go shift M and you decide which layer you want it on and now you see it's in both collections. Oh, 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 I forget we need one more layer. Okay, so let's start from the backlight layer. I'm just going to copy the settings and rename the layer shockwave. 
I will duplicate the backlight geometry and rename it also Shockwave. And I will move it into a collection that I will call Shockwave. In geometry node, I will click the little 2 to get a separate script and I will call it, well, Shockwave. For this one, I don't need a thickness to the wall, so I'm just going to remove it and do a little bit of cleanup. For this one, I want the city to be completely black, so I will assign the black shader. And for the shockwave itself, oh, I forgot to create a shader, so let me go create one. I will go back to the master node because that's where all my shaders are. So I create a new shader and I call it what? Shockwave! Okay, so for now I'm just going to plug a noise texture into an emission and that's it. Now don't forget to assign the right texture in the shockwave uh, geonode graph. Oh, I also forgot the occlusion pass. So we're going to do the same thing again. We're going to copy the shockwave here, call it AOC for ambient occlusion, create a new collection. We're going to put it in there. We're going to call it AOC. I will press on the little number two and call it AOC. And I will apply the AOC shader to the set material instead of the shockwave. So here we go, AOC. Now, I made a mistake when I made the shader. Actually, what I want is the opposite. So you just need to invert the ramp here, and that's all we need to do. And finally, uh, we have the transform node from the original Spark, the master. We need to copy it, and we want to make sure that we put it in shockwave, front light, back light, and AOC. So you just plug it in there, and then you take the translation, and you just connect it into the translation that we had before. So now it's going to follow the original wall. Okay, so I will apply it to the other layers, but be careful here. Since the backlight and the front light uh, script, well, script or node or whatever you call it, they have a double layer for the wall. You want to make sure that you put it at the end right there, and then you can connect it. Okay, so I've been messing around with all my layers here. Before I start rendering, I want to make sure to check every passes one by one to make sure that I, I only have the collections that I need that are turned on. Okay, so all my renders are done. I'm going to do the compositing now. Yes, I do it in Nuke for reasons I explained in my compositing series, my ongoing compositing series. I will not go back there again. Just look at it if you want to see why I use Nuke. Well, you will know. So, okay, Nuke. So basically what I'm going to do, I'm just going to reproduce the script that I did before. So I already have the elements there. I'm just going to copy them. It's going to be faster this way. So I have my render node. It's a multi-layer EXR. And I got the plate here. So I will take the plate and uh, with the grade on it. Because I already put a little grade just to give it a little bit more contrast. If you want to see all the layers that are available in your multi-layer EXR, you can do a layer contact sheet. Just connect the viewer on it by pressing 1 and you will see all the layers. You can also turn on the names so you can see what is what. Okay, so let's create a shuffle node and we're going to select the layer that we want. The first one is going to be the spark. So I just go here and select the one that I want. It's sparked combined. So if I merge it on top of my plate, well, this is what it's going to look like. And you're going to see it's not that good. So select the shuttle first, then the grade, press M to get the merge. And I'm going to change the operation for plus because I want to add the light on the plate. But you see, it's kind of flat on the building here. We lose all the details for the windows and everything. So it doesn't look very realistic. So we need to get the details back. How are we going to do this? Well, we have a plate with the details on it. So why don't we just extract the information from the plate? I'm going to do this by creating a keyer node. And this is going to extract the luminance of the plate. So you just type keyer here, plug it in the plate the plate okay and now if you look at the alpha you get the black and white image and if you play with the sliders you can adjust the contrast to get exactly what you want which is the high contrast areas of the windows so let me just adjust it the way i want it yeah that's uh, that looks pretty good all right okay so i'm going to take my merge here and i'm going to connect it on the luminance just to see what it's going to look like and well it looks the same because well first of all i need to change the viewer to uh, rgb so i press r to go back to rgb and i need to shuffle my keyer to put the alpha into each of the colors the rgb so now I get it in the color instead of the alpha. And here in the merge, instead of plus, I'm going to change it to multiply. So you can see already it gives you a completely different result. Now the problem is that we get some black that is on top of the sparks and we don't want that. So what we're going to do is to extract the sparks. And we're going to do this the exact same way. We're going to create another keyer here. And I'm going to connect it to my image. Uh, actually not the image, I need to connect it on the shuffle. Because otherwise you don't see anything. So. I will just unplug it and plug it into the shuffle. Yeah, okay. Now I'm going to extract the highlights. Again, you want to make sure that your viewer is looking at the alpha and not the RGB by pressing A in the viewer. 
Okay, so I tweaked the settings and yeah, that looks pretty good. This is what I want. So I created another merge node. You just press M if you want a merge node. And I connected to the original image and the mask I connected to the luminance. And now that the sparks are fixed, I'm gonna put them on top of the plate. So I select my merge and my grade, I press M and now I can see them over. I'm gonna change this to plus. So now I added my sparks on top of the city. It's the exact same thing for the front light and for the back light. Well, kind of. So let me create another shuffle node here and I'm gonna get my front light. So again, I go into the little RGB menu here and I select my front light. Uh, here we go. For this one, we also need to multiply the windows like we did for the previous one for the sparks. We already have the keying done here, so we just need to create a merge node and multiply it on top. So I will connect it straight to this node here, change this one to multiply, and here we go. But this light is white, maybe we don't want it white, maybe we want to grade it and change the contrast a little bit also. So I will create a grain node, and from there you can play with the gain for the colors. So add any color that you want, change the gamma, and yeah, that looks pretty good. All right, so let's try this. Actually, it's kind of saturated, so maybe I could create a saturation node. So saturation and uh, reduce it a little bit. Yeah, okay, that's good. Now I will take my saturation and just plug it on my plate here, and I will change this to screen. It could be plus also, but plus keeps adding, and you will get values that will go over one if you go from zero to one for the RGB, but screen will never clip. It will never go more than one. So same thing for the backlight. I'm just going to copy this part of the tree here. I'm going to reconnect this to, whoa, 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 whoa. I'm going to reconnect this to the original image, and uh, I'm going to connect this back up. But for this one, of course, I need to change it to backlight because we already did the front light, so backlight uh, combined. And let's take a look at it. It's all black, and that's because the multiply here is not connected to anything. So I need to connect it back to the city keyer that we did. So I'm just gonna drag it back to the shuffle right here. Okay, I'm gonna mess a little bit with the grades for the backlight. I want it stronger, and that's why I rendered them separately so I can have control over the backlight and the front light. So I'm gonna do something a little bit different. And as you can see, this is something you wanna do in comp. You don't wanna play with the colors in Blender because it, if you don't like your colors, you have to re-render again. Anything you can do in comp, do it in comp. It's always faster and you get real-time feedback. Okay, so it's bright in the back. I like it, it's pretty cool. Now, what else? Now I'm going to add the force field layer. And for this one, I will also need the occlusion pass that we did. So I will create two shuffles, connect them both on top and set one to occlusion and set the other one to the uh, the shockwave. Actually, when I redid the stuff in Blender, I called it shockwave, but for the original render, I called it dome. So dome shockwave, it's the same thing. So this is my dome slash shockwave, and this is the occlusion. And what I want to do is use the occlusion to modify the shockwave so that it looks stronger when it touches the buildings. So a gray node under the shockwave and the mask here will be connected to the occlusion. One thing important is that we rendered the occlusion on the RGB channel, not the alpha. So I'm going to connect the blue, could be the red, the green or whatever, into the alpha so that now when I do my grade, it's going to work well for the mask. So you can see as I play with the grades, you can see the effect it does around the buildings. And this is what I'm looking for. Okay, let's say I'm happy with this. Now I will connect my grade to my plate. So I select this one and this one and I press M. They are connected together and I will change it to screen. In my original script, I had a PXF distort. This is gonna create the distortion around the buildings. Now this is a plugin, a Nuke plugin. They're called gizmos in, the, in Nuke. And you can find a ridiculous amount of free plugins at this website, so nukepedia.com, the link is in the description. So PXF, you can see there's a bunch of different options that you can choose from. What we want is to use the distort. Now, the way it works is quite simple. You just plug your image and in the lens, you plug a black and white image and this is gonna be used for the distortion. And we're gonna use the occlusion for the distortion. So now if I play with these settings, you will see what it does. You see, it distorts around the buildings. Well, we don't wanna go too strong on this because otherwise it's gonna look ugly. Another thing you may want to add is chromatic aberration. This is always useful when you do CG compositing because CG is too sharp. It's always sharper than the plate. So I'm gonna plug my chromatic aberration here and let's see what it does if I play with it. So yeah, it works. It does create the chromatic aberration. We can see it on the building, especially on the edges. The more you go on the edges, the more you're gonna see it, see before and after. But the problem is I don't want to affect the plate. I only want to affect the CG. So I will move it somewhere else. So well, the first thing we need to do is to disconnect the plate from the top here. So we don't want the plate to be affected. So I'm just gonna disconnect it from the merge. 
Okay, let me move this down a little bit. Okay, I'm going to create a new merge node. I'm going to connect the plate on it and all my script, everything I did before for the effects. I want the distortion to be plugged after this. And now I want my chromatic aberration to be right there. So I get all the effects. I get the chromatic aberration. It goes on the merge here on the plate. And after this, I get my distortion. Don't forget the merge node needs to be in screen. Now let's add a camera shake. That's going to happen as the wave goes through the city. And it's very simple. We're just going to animate it. So let's say at uh, frame zero or at frame one, uh, the amplitude will be zero because there's nothing going on. It's too far away. So zero, you right click to create the keyframe. Then you go to your last frame and you change the amplitude to whatever you want. So let's say uh, 100. Uh, this is trial and error. You need to try, to try all that stuff. And now you can see that the frame is moving. It's shaking. But you can see sometimes you can see the border because we don't have enough to cover the entire shake. So we need to scale it a little bit. So the fixed scale here, I'll put it to 1.045. I know that's the number because I tried it. But I know that, that this covers the entire camera shake range. So that's the basic stuff. Now we need to give it a little bit of love. So in the original script, I had some blur and I had also some glow that I added to give it, you know, more punch and make it more realistic. So right after our spark pre-com, this little, not a pre-com, but this little area that we did, I'm going to create a glow and you can see already it makes a big effect. Well, it's actually kind of strong. So maybe I can reduce the amount of glow and you do this using the size slider. Okay, now after the front light, I'm going to add a blur because I want to blur the edges. I don't want it too sharp and uh, my buildings don't match perfectly with the real city. So that's just going to help a little bit. So some blur here. Now I want to use the same blur everywhere. So I'm going to select my blur here and do Alt K. That's going to create a clone of the blur, which means that if I change one of them, they will all change with the same values. Well, they're clones. That's what they do. So another one here, I will put it right here for the shockwave. And now if I look at the final result, this is what I get. Okay, I didn't show this in the first part of the tutorial, but when I did the teaser, I also added this layer, an extra layer of stuff moving around so I could comp it on top, just, you know, change the saturation, put some grade on it, put it on screen so that the force field looks more organic, so more alive, you know, stuff moving around. And here we go. This is the final result. And because we made it properly, we can reuse the same setup for any number of shots that we want. Obviously, this is a toned down version of what we did for the ESPN commercial. Uh, I mean, we spent a few weeks on it to do it. We did all the shockwaves and we did all the magic on the players and everything. The rest was done by another company, but we did all the compositing. So I hope you enjoyed it and uh, I will see you soon. Hey guys, look, I got a little tiny disco ball from my Christmas tree. Hey, did you see that my Christmas tree was going down as I was doing the clip? Well, if you did, write disco in the comments.